Uh, got it. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, our colloquium speaker today, Dr. Mark Staus. Uh, Dr. Uh, Mark is a NIST fellow. He received a Bachelor of Science degree in physics from Yale in uh, 1981, and his PhD in physics from Cornell in 1986. He then did a postdoc research at the AT&T Bell Lab for about two years before uh, joining NIST as a research staff in 1988. Mark became an APS fellow in 2004 and was awarded a silver medal from the Department of Commerce the next year. He has served as associate editors for Physical Review Letters and recently for the Review of Modern Physics. As a condensed matter theorist, Mark did many seminal works on magnetism and the spin tonics, including uh, spin transfer torques, exchange bias, uh, magnetic damping, etc. His research interests has recently shifted to neuromorphic computing. Today, he will tell us uh, how to use magnetic tunnel junctions to compute like the brain, which is the smartest organ in our body, according to the brain. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Okay, so without further ado, Mark, please. Thank you for the nice introduction. Okay, so first, for those of you who are really expecting a physics talk, I have to apologize in advance. This is really a talk about what a physicist does and thinks about when he starts doing something a little bit outside of his expertise. And so what I'm gonna try to do is tell you, you know, so what I'm trying to do is use some of my Spintronics expertise to leverage into figuring out how you might do computing better. And what we're going to do is to try to use the brain as inspiration to figure out how to do that and how to do it with novel devices. And so sort of two parts of the talk. The first is why compute like the brain? And there's sort of two reasons people traditionally have done that is one is try to make models of the brain so that we can understand how the brain works better. And the other is to try to figure out if we can do things the way the brain does so that we can use computers more efficiently. And then I'll talk about doing it with magnetic tunnel junction. So why magnetic tunnel junction? So part of the reason is that's so I can leverage some expertise but there are really two other good reasons. One is they're multifunctional. You can do lots of different things with magnetic tunnel junctions, and I'll, and I'll try to point that out to you. And the other is, it's, is that they're technology ready. They already exist in the state-of-the-art fabs. And so if you can figure out something useful to do with them, the barrier to implementation is, is very short. So before I get started, I would like to acknowledge all of the people that I have done this work with. Uh, it's been a joy collaborating with lots of different people. The names and bolds are, are people who were postdocs when they were working with me. But because I'm going into a new field, I've learned a lot from all of these people. And it's really been one of the great joys of changing fields is the ability to learn lots of new things again. All right, so here's a brief overview of the talk. The, the two main points are up at the top. Uh, the brain does sing some things much better than we do with computers. And so trying to imitate the brain is potentially a good way to try to compute more efficiently. And the other, as I mentioned a minute ago, spintronic devices, particular magnetic tunnel junctions, give a lot of different ways to do this. Now, there's a little bit of a disconnect between trying to use the brain for inspiration and trying to introduce novel devices into the process. And it's really important when you're doing this is to keep the whole picture in, in mind. So from the brain, you can think of different architectures, you can think of different ways to encode the information. But in order to do something with that with a novel device, you need to figure out how the novel device can tie into those parts and how you would integrate it into the rest of everything you want to do. And I'll try to give you an example of how this process ties together. And so 
the, the box down on the lower right, uh, I guess lower left of every, your, your lower left, um, is where my expertise is. For the last 20 years, I've mostly been working in the same field that Shule works in on current control of spintronic and magnetic properties, in particular spin transfer torques and spin orbit torques. And so I'm trying to leverage that expertise into figuring out how to integrate possible magnetic devices into novel computers. And there's two broad classes of magnetic devices that people are working on. It, one I would roughly categorize as thin film devices. These are systems like skirmions or magnetic domain walls or spin waves that exist sort of in extended thin films. What I'm gonna focus on are magnetic tunnel junctions uh, because of the reasons I, I mentioned earlier. There's, they're multifunctional and they're a, a ready to go technology. All right, so I keep telling you the brain is a good source for inspiration. Why do I keep saying that? Well, there's a lot of things that we're asking computers to do that the brain does much better. So you guys may remember back five years ago, there was finally a competition where a computer was able to beat a world grandmaster in the game of Go, which is considered the most difficult game for a computer to play. And it was close. I mean, it was a four to one match. So it wasn't like the computer was so much better than the human, but the human brain is operating at 20 Watts and the computer that beat him was operating at 40,000 Watts. So clearly, the brain is doing something a lot more efficiently than we're able to do with the computers. What can we do with that? Another example is uh, training these big neural networks. So there's uh, a, a natural language processing model. There's a bunch of models, I've plotted them there. One in particular one that we could get some information on called GPT-3 to train that model so that it could do natural language processing took 355 GPU years. So it, the, the amount of energy that that required was 500 megawatt hours. Now to put that in scale, that's about the yearly energy consumption per capita of people in the US of 20 people. Or another way is if I look at, take that 20 watts that the human brain is operating at, that's 2,500, brain years. So if we make a comparison, let's say a 20-year-old has the same skill at natural language processing, and uh, they spent the 20 years learning that, and maybe they were using 10% of their uh, brain doing that. So they're using about 20 brain years to, to learn that. So they're, they're doing that, it's still 100 times the efficiency that this computer is, do, is doing. How can we learn from that? Self-driving cars, everybody wants those to happen. Right now, the energy that's needed to compute the self-driving aspects, to read all the sensors, process that information, is 10% of the power of a typical car, which is the equivalent of 100 people. That's a lot of backseat drivers you have to worry about. Um, all right. So why are computers different than, than, the, than the brain? So computers were originally developed to do things that we're not good at doing, like high precision numerical calculations, like computing the trajectory to send a satellite to orbit around Mars. You need to have very accurate calculations to do that. On the other hand, what the brain is good at is recognizing faces, understanding voices, recognizing images. And, and so they're very different jobs. The, the categorical reasoning doesn't require the same precision that it does to calculate an orbit around, around Mars. So one of the big differences between the computers is in the architecture. And so the original computer had different technology being used for the processing and the memory. And the model that John von Neumann came up had those separate where you would take data from memory, process it, and then put it back into memory. So you were shuttling things back and forth. And that's great when you're doing things that are processing intensive. 
But when you're doing things that are data intensive, like image processing or voice recognition, that's very inefficient. And you waste a lot of your energy, not in the actual computing, but just in shuttling the information around. Whereas the brain, on the other hand, has very simple, small processing units and neurons. It's got a lot of them. They're spread out throughout the whole brain and they're connected by a lot of synapses. And the synapses control the connection between the, the neurons and that's where all the information is. So the memory is stored right next to the processing unit. And so there's no energy spent moving this information around as the processing is happening in the brain. And the other thing is there's very different models for how to encode the information in the brain. So in, the, in a computer, you have two different voltage levels, a zero and a one, very well-defined, discrete. And then at regular intervals, the whole thing's clocked, everything's synchronous, it's completely deterministic, everything can be predicted exactly what happens. And you have this binary representation for these ones and zeros. It gives you this high precision that you get in inside a computer. On the other hand, in the brain, the neurons communicate with each other by spikes, and they just send these spikes out. And how do those spikes carry information? They're roughly all the same size. The information comes in in the rate at which the, the neurons are firing, or the timing at which they're firing, or oscillatory patterns that get set up, like I have illustrated over there to the right. And this is all analog information rather than digital, and it's random and it's asynchronous. And so can we use some of that to try to change the way that we do information processing? So the simplest model that people have come up with to try to imitate the brain is a neural network. And so I can imagine I have all those neurons and synapses up there, and I'm gonna make a very simple model for a neuron. It's gonna take a bunch of inputs and rather than taking in spike trains, we're just gonna have it take in spike rates. So it's just gonna be a number telling you what the average spike rate is coming on in on each of those channels. It's gonna sum those up and then it's gonna act on that sum with some nonlinear function. And then based on the output of that nonlinear function, it's gonna pass that information on. And that information is then gonna go through synapses that are connected to the next layer of neurons. And each of those synapses contains a weight, just a numerical value that multiplies the rate, output rate of one neuron and sends the rate times that weight into the next layer of neurons. And so we'll set up a network like this where we have successive layers of neurons that take the output from the previous layer and send it, send it on to the next layer with a forward flow of information. There's no recursive information flow. Now, if you look at that, and if you imagine I have N neurons in one layer and M neurons in the next layer, I have N times M synapses connecting them. That's a lot. And if you think about it, that looks like a matrix vector multiply where the input to the next layer is the matrix of synaptic weights times the output of the previous layer vector. And that, in fact, is where you spend most of your time in implementing one of these neural networks, which I should point out are all over the place. When you do a Google search, when you do voice recognition, when you have a face recognized by some program, all that's being done by this type of neural network. So what happens is you take your information and here is a binary representation of an A and I vectorize that and I feed it into the first layer of, neural net, of the neural network. And then I get outputs at the end and whichever one is biggest, that's what, that's what the information is. Once I've trained the network so that all of the synaptic weights are, are correct. And the power of these neural networks comes from two facts. One is that you have a huge number of free parameters. These synaptic weights make this very flexible. And the fact that the neurons act with this nonlinear function on the inputs make these generalized functions able to 
mimic very complicated functions that allow you to take two things that are close but deserve to be separated and move them apart and two things that are apart but should be close in the end move them together and that's that's what the power of these neural networks is so we want to try to make these things better we want to try to do better than that type of neural network and when you think about computer science, they, people will talk about a computational stack where you have different abstraction layers. You have the physical devices down at the bottom and up at the top, you have the software. And then there are distinct layers in between where you don't need to know the details of what's happening in the layer below or the layer above. You just need to have some interfacial connection information in, in this particular stack. And you can make improvements at all levels, right? So the original neural networks were all just implemented in software on typical computers. And then people have made continuous advances in the software on how to do that more efficiently, how to design neural networks better. But they also realized, hey, we're doing all these matrix vector multiplies. We can do that better if we do that on a GPU or even a TPU, which was developed just to do these matrix vector multiplies. And so with these advances at just these levels, in one year, they were able to reduce by a factor of 200 or so the amount of energy it took to play the game of Go. There's still two orders of magnitude away from the how well the human does it, but they're getting better and better all the time. What people are interested in pursuing now in a lot of the big companies like Intel and IBM and Google is to develop spiking networks, not networks that communicate by the numbers representing the rates, but actually sending spikes between neurons. And there are some of the chips that have been developed to actually do this type of calculation. And so that's one direction people are trying to do to improve things even further. What we're interested in as physicists is operating down here at the bottom and trying to come up with novel hardware that can make these things uh, more efficient. Now, one of the complications is if I'm trying to do that, what is it that I want the hardware to do? Well, to know what I want the hardware to do, I really have to think about what I'm trying to do with it. And if I'm trying to think about developing novel architectures to use this hardware, I have to need, I need to know what that hardware can do. And so there's kind of a chicken and egg problem here and that you don't have well-defined needs on either end. And so you really have to look at both sides at the same time to figure out where you can come together and actually offer some big advantage. So when you're thinking about putting new hardware into a system, one of my contentions, and not all physicists working in this area agree with me, but one of my contentions will be, we're going to use standard <coughs> integrated circuits, i.e. CMOS, as the substrate for doing this. And there are a couple good reasons that I think are going to make that true during my lifetime. And one is that the way the brain works is that the energy in the incoming signals doesn't provide the energy for the outgoing signals. That's provided by chemical processes that happen in the brain. And that allows you to do fan out. So one neuron is going to send information out to 10,000 synapses. It can't possibly do that based on the incoming energy. It has to have a, a, an additional energy source. And that's the way CMOS is designed. If you look at this schematic for an inverter there, it, and you see the signal coming in on the incoming line, you don't see any connections to the output. It just controls the gate. And, and the energy and the current for the output comes from the high voltage line being connected to the ground line. And so the output signal has this big reservoir that it can drive, draw from, and that will enable you to do fan out. And that's something that when a lot of times when physicists are designing logic gates, they'll show you one gate that could then drive another gate, but they can't possibly do fan out because they don't have this ubiquitous source of energy that can drive that sort of thing. The other thing is that we're really good at making CMOS. Back in 2014, 
more than two to the 20th transistors were made. That number is just unbelievably big, right? That, you know, there's 10 billion people in the world. That's 10 billion transistors for each of those 10 billion people. And that number is just going up faster and faster and faster all the time. Transistors are everywhere. We're really good at making this. We perfected the process and we're not gonna be able to make any other process comparable unless we make that much of the same thing. But there's no way to make that much of anything unless we can already beat CMOS. And so there's, it's gonna be very hard to displace it in terms of cost. However, CMOS isn't perfect. It was designed to do digital processing really well. You can do analog processing, but that doesn't have anywhere near the same state of development. And there's some things that aren't naturally done in CMOS. And one is non-volatile memory. I mean, one of the reasons it takes a while for a computer to boot up is that you can't store information in the, in the semiconductor memory. And so you have to load it all in from disk or from the solid state disk into the actual working memory before the computer will start to do anything. If you had non-volatile memory, you wouldn't have to do that. It would, the computer would come right back onto the case where it was when you, when you turned it up, when you powered it down. The other thing is plasticity. What do I mean by plasticity? So the way the synapses work is they have memory. So they have some value for the connection between neurons, but that memory can change depending on the behavior of the two neurons that it connects. And that ability to slowly change is called plasticity. And that's what allows the brain to learn. And that's again, something that's not natural in CMOS. Another thing is it's deterministic. If you have a process that's stochastic, that might be better done in some other technology rather than CMOS. And you can make CMOS oscillators, but they're not particularly uh, compact or low energy. And so if you could make an oscillator that was smaller and more efficient, that might offer some real advantages. And the technology I'm gonna propose to solve at least three of those uh, are magnetic tunnel junctions. All right, so what are magnetic tunnel junctions? For those of you who are not familiar with them, two thin magnetic films separated by a few atomic layers of an insulator. In particular, it's almost always magnesium oxide. And the thing that makes these particularly valuable is that the resistance of this tunneling device, when I pass a current vertically through it, depends on the relative orientation of the two magnetizations. And so if they're parallel, that's a low resistance state. And if they're anti-parallel, that's a high resistance state. And so you could imagine that could make a good sensor. And that's how magnetic read heads work. You have two magnetic fields that are magnetizations that fluctuate and you read the resistance and that's what allows you to read the information on a hard disk. It could work well as a memory because I can store a zero in the anti-parallel state and a one in the parallel state. And I can read that simply through its resistance. The thing that's made this a viable commercially is that I don't need to have a magnetic field to switch these two elements. I can switch them with a current. And so if I pass a large a current larger than it, what it takes to read the resistance, I can switch the magnetization from the low resistance state by passing an, an electric current in one direction, and then it'll hop up into the high resistance state, and then it's stable there for a while until I pass enough direct current in the opposite direction when it comes back down and is stable there. Or more recently, people have determined that if you pass a current through a heavy metal layer that's under the switchable layer, that creates a spin current that flows up into that uh, uh, magnetic layer and also exerts a torque on it. And so down in the lower right, you can see a measurement of the resistance of the tunnel junction that you're measuring by passing a small current through the tunnel junction as a function of the current flowing through the heavy metal layer underneath it. And you can see, again, switching between the low resistance state and the high resistance state. And this ability to control 
the state of the magnetic tunnel junction purely electrically is what allows it to scale down to small enough sizes to make it uh, a real viable technology. And so you can see this, here is a image, an SEM image of a magnetic tunnel junction that's been integrated into the back end of the line. That means you take a semiconductor surface and you make all the transistors, and then you grow the metal wires on top of that that connect them all together. And then when you have that all done, that's the back end of the line. And then you can grow magnetic tunnel junctions there, which are then connected to the transistors. And so you have these uh, magnetic tunnel junctions integrated into these integrated circuits. And you can see that this is a technology that exists at high-end fabs uh, in cutting edge technologies. And so it's, it's really there. <coughs> These are being developed for non-volatile memory uh, in different types of applications, uh, it, which is why they're being integrated there. But if we can, again, if we can do something that's close to that, it's, we're pretty close to the technology. So another thing that you can do with magnetic tunnel junctions, which is a little bit strange. So I take a magnetic tunnel junction and I pass a DC current through it. Now, the current, when it goes from one layer to the other becomes spin polarized. And that spin polarized current coming into the second layer exerts a torque on it. And that torque can destabilize the magnetization and that's what causes switching. But if I tune the geometry just right, as I increase the excitation of this, that compensates the magnetic damping and I can settle into a steady state processional state where I have a gigahertz type process that's being caused by this deep DC input current. And then if I measure the voltage across this tunnel junction, because the resistance depends on the relative orientation of the magnetization and the current is constant, I get this AC voltage coming out of this. And this so-called spin torque oscillator has been proposed and used and demonstrated for several types of brain-like computing, taking advantage of this very compact and efficient uh, oscillator. The configuration I'm going to focus on is again, something that you might not think about doing. If I wanna make a memory that has two states, and I want that memory to be good for years, I have to have a fairly large barrier between those two states. And that means that it takes a fairly large amount of energy to switch between those configurations. On the other hand, if I didn't want my memory to be quite so good, if I was using it in some intermediate short-term memory in a computer where I only needed it for microseconds, and then I might be happy with a memory that was only good for milliseconds, and I could make the barrier a lot lower and then have a device that didn't cost as much energy to switch. What I'm interested in is actually going even further and going down to a barrier that's small enough that the magnetization makes spontaneous thermal flips between the two different configurations, what, what, I'm, what I'm gonna call a, a super paramagnetic tunnel junction because it's kind of a macroscopic object that's thermally fluctuating between these two different configurations. Now, one of the nice things about that is again, by passing a current through or under one of these devices, I can change the relative flipping rates and I can change the relative amount of time than it spends in either of the different configurations. So here's an example of that. Uh, so I'm passing a current in two possible different directions through this tunnel junction. And one direction favors, stabilizes the parallel state. And the other direction stabilizes the anti-parallel state. And so if you look at the red points, you can see that on average, I'm down in the low resistance parallel state. I make occasional jumps up to the anti-parallel state, but I don't stay very long there. So I have a fairly low transition rate and a low average resistance. 
And then as I go to the balance point where I'm spending equal amount of time in both configurations, I see much faster transitions from both. So I see a lot of jumps. And then as I increase the current in the other direction, I come back so that I'm spending now most of the time in the anti-parallel state, again, with a lower transition rate. And you can use either of these curves for uh, doing different models of computing. Uh, and the one I'm gonna talk about is making use of this sigmoidal curve up at the top. All right. So, Here's a sort of one slide summary of the different types of works I've been doing with spintronic implementations of brain-like computing. And so you can see it's a, it's a big mix. So there's different models that people have for how the brain encodes information, whether it's in oscillations, in spike rates, or in spike timing. And there's different configurations that you can use magnetic tunnel junctions in, whether it's oscillators or memory or super paramagnetic tunnel junctions. And we've either modeled or implemented physically different possible types of configurations to take advantage of these things. And I'm gonna talk about two of these in this talk, but if you know somebody wanted to me to go on for hours, I could talk about each of these because they're all pretty cool. So I wanna start off talking about doing rate-based encoding on a neural network, but using super paramagnetic tunnel junctions. And this is doing something called stochastic computing. All right, so stochastic computing, again, seems a little crazy when you first start thinking about it. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, stochastic computing represents numbers between zero and one. And if I pick a number between zero and one, I'm going to generate random bits with that probability and then a bit stream is going to represent that number. And it may not be exactly right. So you can see when I'm trying to represent 0.2 for this particular bit stream, I get a number out that's 0.19. And the representations tend to get worse when I get closer to 50-50 and better when I get closer to, to either extremes. So why am I doing a representation of a number that requires all these transitions and isn't very precise. Well, so it makes sense to do in calculations that don't require great precision, which is true for neural networks. And the point is, is that I can now do arithmetic operations very, very efficiently. And so for example, if I have two numbers represented by these bit streams, I can multiply them by just putting them into an AND gate. So say I have numbers 0.4 and 0.5 that I want to represent by a bit stream, by these random bit streams. And so I have random bit streams. The product of these numbers gives me 0.2. And if I look at the intersection between the two bit streams, I get a bit stream out that's also representing 0.2. And if I look at the voltage levels coming in to an AND gate, and out of an AND gate, you can see that I'm also doing that multiplication. So rather than building this huge complicated multiplier, I can do the multiplication with a single gate. And so that offers me the potential of some real savings in <coughs> both energy and area in terms of the gate that I'm trying to implement. All right, so here's where I thought, okay, great. Now I'm gonna get to use all my expertise on spin transfer torque because that's how I'm gonna control what the probability is. And as we sat down with the goal of trying to make this efficient, as efficient as possible, what we ended up doing moved away from current control of the probability to actually making use of CMOS circuitries to do it. The problem with using current control is that you're passing a steady current through a resistor and that uses a lot of energy. And so what we want to do is we want to read the state of the resistor with current pulses, which we can do much more efficiently. And so using some relatively standard CMOS circuitry called a precharged sense amplifier that on clock cycles reads the state of the super paramagnetic tunnel junction, we're going to take a tunnel junction that's fluctuating with equal probability in both configurations. And we're going to measure that state 
at clocked intervals. And that's what's going to give me a bit stream. But with this, I only get a bit stream of 0.5. It's not really useful just having a bit stream of 0.5. However, then we'll combine these to make whatever bit streams we want. So if I take a bit stream of 0.5 and a bit stream of 0.5 and put them into an AND gate, I get a bit stream of 0.25. And if I then put that into an inverter, I get a bit stream of 0.75. And then if I take those possible outputs and put those into another in parallel into an OR gate, AND gate with another one of these super paramagnetic tunnel junctions that I'm reading, then I can get all of the, the eights. And then another one, I can get all of the 16s. And so with just four of these super paramagnetic tunnel junctions and the associated CMOS circuitry, I can generate bit streams that give me any 16. Now, I could keep adding them and keep making them more precise. But remember, these are random bit streams. And their accuracy only goes up like 1 over the square root of n for the length of time that I'm doing this. So I don't want to make it too accurate because then I need to go way too long to take the, see an appreciable difference between them. And so this is kind of a sweet spot. And so with this, we're able to make a truly random bit stream at just 10 femtojoules per bit. And when we make something comparable out of CMOS, we make something that's called a lin uh, linear feedback shift register. And that generates pseudo random numbers. But that means that they're strongly correlated with each other. And those are at 20 femtojoules per bit. So here's a situation where we take this magnetic tunnel junction, combine it with this CMOS circuitry, and we can make something that's more efficient and better performing than what you can make out of pure CMOS circuitry. All right, so then we're going to take these. And now we have a real implement, simple implementation of a synapse. We just take the bit stream that's the output of one neuron and put that into one half of an AND gate. And then we have the weight stored in, the, in a bit stream generator. And we just put that into the other side of the AND gate. And we come out with the product of those two, the weight multiplying by the output of the previous, uh, uh, previous neuron. And for neurons, we can use a compound OR gate. So an OR gate does actually both of the things that we want a neuron to do. We want a neuron to sum all of its inputs and then apply a nonlinear transformation on it. And because probabilities are limited to one, an OR gate doesn't give you a simple addition of the two probabilities, but it has this nonlinear correction at the end. And so that's how we're going to make a very simple neuron that's just going to be this compound OR gate that combines all of the inputs and then gives you an output bit stream, which is a nonlinear operation on the sum of the inputs. And we can put those together and make up a simple neural network this way. And then we can do a simulation of how well this works. And so that's what we're reporting here in that curve down at the bottom. And so what we've done is taken a standard neural network, and we picked this neural network because People had done CMOS models of implementing this neural network with stochastic computing. And we're going to test it on a standard data set, which are handwritten digits. And, and that, again, was the same test that the CMOS implementations of this had done. And so the CMOS implementations are in, in color up at the top. And then uh, our super paramagnetic tunnel junction implementation is down at the bottom in this curve. And the different numbers there represent different lengths of bit streams. And so you can see as I make the bit stream longer, the energy it takes to do the computation goes up. So does the accuracy, but only up to a certain point. Because if I make the bit stream too long now, the numbers that I'm putting in are only accurate up to a 16th. And so there's no real payoff to making the bit streams too much longer. And so there's an optimum right around 128 or 256, where we're computing with much lower energy than the CMOS implementations, but we're not achieving the, the accuracy. And this is where we humbly say as physicists and not computer scientists, 
we think that if we were to apply some real expertise, we could do better, we could reach the accuracy of the CMOS implementations at a lower energy, but that requires different expertise than, than what we have. But again, this is a demonstration that it's, it's a viable technology to, to approach these things. Well, also, so, so it's, uh, it's a generation of the bitstream, and then they're using these linear feedback shift registers, so they have correlated bitstreams. And so they have to worry about figuring out how to get rid of those correlations. And so they don't use the AND gate, the, the OR gate neurons, which is where we save a lot of the energy is being able to do those because we have the uncorrelated bitstreams. All right, so now I'd like to switch to a, a, a different application, which is again, making a neural network, but this now is, an experimental demonstration that uh, a postdoc and I helped contribute to. Again, it's rate coding based, but now we're going to use a bistable uh, magnetic tunnel junction that uh, is going to be a binary synapse. So the synapse is either going to be on or off uh, in the high state or the low state. And we're going to see if with a small array of those, if we can implement a neural network. And the way we're gonna do this is using a crossbar architecture. And this is something that is being pursued in a lot of different uh, areas to, in, in these novel computing schemes. So you have a, a, a set of wires in one direction, a set of crossing wires, and at each intersection, you have a device where the resistance of that device can vary. And here it's gonna vary between two different states but that's how people would put memristors in there where you can continuously tune the resistance or lots of other two terminal variable resistors. And you, with these crossbars, you naturally just using simple electric circuit rules implement matrix vector multiplies. And so if I apply voltages on the lines representing the input vectors and measure the currents on the output representing the output vectors and the weights are the resistances, the current flowing through any particular resistor is just the voltage on that line times that resist, times the conductance of that resistor. And the current flowing through any one line by Kirchhoff's law is just the sum of all the currents being dumped into it. And so you can see over there on the right, that the vector of currents is equal to the matrix vector multiplication of the conductance matrix times the voltage inputs. And so just at the speed of circuit equilibration, we can do a matrix vector multiply. And so we're gonna do that with a set of magnetic tunnel junctions. We only had a very small array. It was just a 15 by 15 array. So we can only tackle a simple test. And there is a standard data set called the WINE data set, where they took uh, 148 uh, different wines and measured 13 properties of each of these wines. And they came from three different regions of Italy. And so then you're supposed to construct a neural network that takes the values of the measured properties of the wine and runs it through a neural network to tell you which re region it came from. And so that's, the structure of the neural network that we're going to implement over there on the right. And then we're going to test it. And so here on the left is an SEM image of the magnetic tunnel junction crossbar. So you can see the wires going across. And maybe you can't see it. Maybe the people at home can see it better. But there's little white dots in the middle of each of the intersections of those lines. And that's where there's a magnetic tunnel junction connecting the upper and lower wires. And so we generated a target solution in software that would solve this network. And that's represented in the middle image where yellow represents the on state and blue represents the off state. So that's what we want to implement in the network. Now, 
there are problems with the network. The, the lines have high resistivities. And so that it, it makes the network, the, the implementation non-ideal. And there's device to device vari variation that comes in there. And so the values that we actually were able to implement in the neural network are over on the right. And you can see that they tends to be bluer in the middle and yellower on the outside. And that has to do with the line resistances and how long each of the various lines are. And you can see ones that are next to each other that are nominally the same color are varying a little bit. That's a device to device variability. And so the question is with that, how well is it going to work? And so what we did was tested that. And so what you do typically with a neural network is you take your data and you split it into a training set and a test set. And so the open symbols are the training set and the closed symbols are the test set. Now, again, those are training in software and this is now testing the training set in the hardware. So it is still a real test, but then the real test is in, is in the test, which are the solid symbols. And the black arrows up at the top indicate where there were mistakes. In all of the other cases, the correct answer was above the, all of the wrong answers and we got the right answer out of this. So that even though that, imp that implementation was pretty noisy, this neural network is still able to solve this wine data set. Okay, was that a fluke? So what we did, what we did is, because you have all of these parameters in a neural network, if you think about it, if I have a 15 by 15 array, I have two to the 225th possible neural networks. There's a huge degeneracy in possible solutions. And so we're able to find 300 different solutions and test each of them, how well we could implement that in hardware. And so that's what's plotted over there on the right are the success rate for each of those uh, as a function of their, of their index. And you can see that on average, we're able to, with these hard, hardware implementations, get 95% accuracy. And so this means, I mean, these are very crude. These could be improved quite a bit. So this is a possible way of making a neural network that could run some small tests on some data in say something like a remote sensor where you wanted to do some of the processing locally before you send all the information to the cloud and then, and then have it come back. All right, so where are we going in the future? So what we're, what we're gonna do now is try to build more on these ideas of super paramagnetic tunnel junctions. And we have some ideas, but it's still kind of wide open. We're gonna figure out something compelling to do with these. Because if you think about these super paramagnetic tunnel junctions, these are a lot like an Isenmann right, where I, I'm flipping between an upspin and a downspin. But what we want to do is we want to couple these together in some interesting way that gives us some dynamics that allows us to do computation with it. And so we recently experimentally did just the beginning test of that. So how do, how do you couple these magnetic tunnel junctions? So this is the simplest possible way of doing it. Since the performance of the tunnel junction depends on the current going through it, we'll put two magnetic tunnel junctions in parallel and in series with a voltage source and another resistor. So if these are in a low resistance state, most of the voltage drop is across the other resistor. And so the voltage drop across these is low. And so that has some effect on what the transition rates are. But if, they're, if they were to flip and go into the high resistance state, then most of the voltage drop is across them and that changes their transition rates. And so since each one depends on the state of the other, this is going to introduce some coupling between them. And the way we're gonna measure this is just by measuring the voltage across the pair of them. And so here we start off in this low resistance parallel parallel state. And then at one point, one of them makes a transition into the anti-parallel configuration and the voltage increases here, it's a negative voltage. And then the other one flips and the voltage changes again. And then one of them flips back and then the other one flips again. And so we make this time trace of what 
the different voltage states are, how long you were in each voltage state and uh, how fast the transitions happen. And so here is some representative experimental data. And the, the postdoc that did this took a, a breathtaking amount of data. And so there is a time trace for two milliseconds that that looks like a lot of data. Each run that he did was for two seconds. And so each run had a thousand times as many transitions as, as what you were seeing there. And so then what we can do is we can figure out the state of each tunnel junction as a function of time. And so if you look at the green curve and the red curve, those are the auto covariances of each of the tunnel junctions. And so that says that's a correlation of the state of that tunnel junction at one time with the state of that tunnel junction at a, a later time. And because these are fluctuating randomly, you expect that to decay roughly exponentially. And they both do. But what's interesting is looking at the cross correlation. Because if these were uncorrelated, making jumps completely independently of each other, you would have zero for a, a cross correlation. But we see a finite cross correlation here. And what the positive value there says is that the device is spending more time in the parallel, parallel, and anti parallel, anti parallel states than it's spending in the two mixed states. And so now what we want to try to do is increase this interaction between these different tunnel junctions, build networks out of them where we can control the coupling between different elements of the network, and then do things like look at restricted Boltzmann machines, which are a way of doing computations with Ising-like spins, build pseudoactive matter where we have asymmetric networks where you can set up cycles that happen and build up sort of stochastic oscillatory behavior. And look at time-dependent time computing that's not deterministic, which has some advantage of it. And these are sort of what the wide open future looks like, that which, what we're gonna be working on for the next four years or so. So anyway, let me finish. Hopefully, I said a lot, but the two main things that I want you to take away from this is that looking at the brain, because it does some things much more efficiently than we can do with computers right now, Hopefully we can learn from that to do things more efficiently in computers that are things that the brain does well. And that to help that process along, spintronic devices have a lot to offer because they're multifunctional and they already exist in the CMOS fabs. To, to do this, you can't just think about the brain and you can't just think about the devices, but you have to think about the whole picture how you're gonna encode the information, what the architecture is gonna be, how the devices are all gonna be coupled to each other. And it's important to take all of that into consideration when you're computing the efficiency. Almost every physics paper I read about novel computing tells me about how much power is dissipated in the device that's of interest. What I wanna know is how much power is dissipated in the control circuitry to control that device. Because if that number is much bigger, I don't really care about how much, how efficient your particular device is because it's the whole circuit working together that determines whether that's important. And I talked about different configurations that magnetic column junctions can be used in and gave you some examples for uh, super paramagnetic tunnel junctions and uh, stable tunnel junctions implementing neural nets. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for that very nice talk. Any questions? Jesse? Something I didn't understand about this. I guess you're talking about like a crossbar. Uh huh. Uh, and you would train it uh, on, a, on a model system and then somehow load those things. Right. So I guess I don't know if training works because everybody can't train it on the actual hardware. And is that how so it takes for track that the hardware is training? So, so that's what we want to do. Uh, so, you know, this is where me as a theorist, that's exactly what I suggested. And okay, so what they come back to me with is we only have four source measure units. We would need to have 30 source measure units to be able to do that. 
right? It, it, you just don't have the number of connections. But ultimately, that is exactly what you want to do. And actually, the thing that we want to do with this, it sort of comes back to the spin transfer torque and gets me excited again, is to do inline training doing stochastic programming. So when you do the training, you need to have continuous values. But here we only have binary values. And so what you can do during the training is if the, you want to have a 0.5, you can only implement one or zero. But what you can do is try to implement one or zero with a probability of 0.5. And then it'll take longer to do it, but that's a way of doing inline training. And, and, and that's one of the things that we're planning on, on doing with these circuits. Um, this is all classical, um, and there there is a oh yes, thank you. Uh, so the so the question is uh, condensed. What's the relation of this classical work I've talked about to quantum computing? And uh, so right now we're in. Um, uh, we're in the NISC area era of quantum computing, and that represents intermediate scale, inaccurate, unreliable quantum computers. And there is some discussion that that maps well to machine learning. And so quantum machine learning is a way of combining both of these things that might have some advantages. And uh, we actually put in an internal proposal to work on that, uh, but it was too abstract for the physics lab and it was too applied for the information technology lab. And so it didn't go anywhere, but there, there are people working on that and there, and there are overlaps. Um, my driving force is to be able to come up with things that work well at room temperature. And so that's going to basically force you into classical implementations. So, so the uh, speed of, say, the stochastic computing that I talked about, that's going to be slow, right? And my argument is that. You can compensate for speed with numbers, but you can't compensate for energy. And so what I want to optimize is the energy per computation, not the speed. If I need something twice as fast, I can make twice as many computers doing it in parallel. But if it costs a certain amount of energy to do it, and that amount of energy is too much. I mean, one of the slides I didn't show it, because I can't find a, a version of it that I believe is reliable, is people plot the amount of energy being used in data centers as a function of year and plot that versus the global electrical usage. And those lines cross in 2040 or something like that, which means we'd be using all of our electrical power in data centers. So we have to figure out a way of doing this better. We, you know, if you want to use a self-driving car, you have to reduce the amount of uh, volume and weight and uh, power of the computer that's doing the self-driving part of the car. And so that's, it, from that point of view, it re, from my point of view, you need to get things done fast. But what's really crucial is how little energy can you do it? Uh, there's actually nothing from the, from the Zoom room, so I just have to place the panel. And I guess there's more comment that, as you know, it's a good by an hour that we can do computations, so there's no energy. So there's plenty of room at the bottom. Uh, but the question I had was a little bit more fuzzy, was just, uh, uh, you know, I guess the reason we built some transistors is that they're so multi-purpose, they can do almost anything with them. Whereas these implementations are going to be necessarily restricted. 
So that tension that you. Uh, so, so uh, there, there was a, there was a there, so, so, okay. Let me repeat the question. The question the question is, um, in the in the past we've had general purpose hardware, and what I'm proposing are things that are very specialized. Aren't these in conflict? Absolutely, they are. But if you'll notice, what's happened is you know the so-called end of Moore's law where chips aren't getting faster and faster because of power dissipation. So more and more chips are developing specialty components like a TPU, which is just for doing matrix vector multiplies. And so you'll have a little part of your chip that does matrix vector multiplies. Maybe you have a part of your chip that does neural networks that you can train efficiently and it will just do that part of the calculation. Or you have a remote sensor that you that's taking in a lot of data and you don't want to blast all that data out to the cloud. And so you want to process it with some simple processor locally before you broadcast it out, out to the cloud. And so, yes, it absolutely is going to be uh, specialized. That's where you're going to get your gain in, in efficiency. And that's ultimately what's going to be the driver for it is making enough of those things, like a self-driving car. If you can do that, that who cares how specialized it is, if that's the only thing it's good for, it's good for that, that's enough. So if I paraphrase, you're saying that CMOS is very integration as well, and so- Yes. You can take a different so for the remote people, his paraphrasing was, this is the direction that CMOS is going in as well. And what I would say is, I'm not going to try to beat CMOS, right? Every technology that's come along that says it's going to beat CMOS hasn't beaten CMOS. I'm not going to try to beat CMOS. I'm going to try to help CMOS. I'm going to try to do something that it can easily incorporate that helps it do it more efficiently. And that's where I think we could make some contribution. Could you go back to the slide with the Oh, all right. Uh, uh, yeah, so I was a little confused. Is this um, not in the function that they're implementing in this special case? Um, the only type of company function that they support is creating other types? Well, so in, in fact, you, you can see the red points up there. You see ReLU, Tanch, and Logistic. Those are all different nonlinear functions that they implemented in CMOS. So the, the ReLU is a, a zero, then linear, the Tanch is a Tanch function, and the logistics is some function that's kind of like that, but not exactly the same. And so, yes, absolutely. And those probably work better than the nonlinearity that we get from the compound or gate because it's not a well-defined nonlinearity because it depends in detail on the bit streams that come in. We're hoping that it's good enough because uh, it is so much more energy efficient than trying to implement these other nonlinearities, which all have to be basically done. You know, you have to take this stochastic bit stream, collect all the information, convert it into a binary representation, apply this nonlinear function, and then regenerate the bit stream, right? And when you have to do those transitions between domains, that can be very inefficient. Any other questions? If that's not the case, let's thank our speaker again. We have, uh... I have a question, but I can ask later. Okay. I have an appointment to, to five. Okay. Thank you. It's nice to have a physicist explain computer science. <laughs> <laughs> it's always good having somebody who speaks your language explain something to you. Oh, thank you. Okay. All right.